Hey folks, Quilly Teen here, and welcome to the long-awaited second part of our look at the D&D 5th Edition basic rules and what changes have come up. I'm going to try to hopefully burn through this a little faster than the last one, but I don't have any real hope for that. Anyway, we are currently in Chapter 7 using Ability Scores, and one of the things to note right away is that there are no more skill checks in D&D 5th Edition, although that's sort of a difference more in, uh, in wording than anything else. Everything is an Ability Check instead. However, there are certain skills that if you are proficient in, you would then get a bonus. So for example, it's not a stealth check, it's a dexterity parentheses stealth check. Uh, and then so it indicates right away that, hey, this is you use your dexterity skill for this. And also, if you happen to be skilled in stealth, then maybe you get some bonuses or something. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, there is, uh, there's our ability score modifiers that is totally unchanged. Advantage and disadvantage of the new system in 5th edition that I think is probably going to be quite nice. Uh, basically, instead of having to keep track of uh, as quite as many you know little modifiers, plus 2 this, minus 2 that, um, a lot of things where you might have gotten those modifiers in the past, you will now instead get advantage and disadvantage too. Advantage simply means if you have advantage on a roll, you roll twice and you take the best one. If you have disadvantage, you roll twice and take the worst one. If you have both advantage and disadvantage, and it doesn't matter how many times you have any one, is just a normal straight up roll. So if you have advantage 10 times for something and you have one disadvantage, it turns it into just a normal roll. Um, and I, I really think it's quite nice. I actually, uh, when we did our little test games with some players, people quite like the the fact that they get to roll two dice and then keep the best one. It makes it averages things, averages things out a little bit more. And it's certainly a lot stronger than just getting a plus two, uh, but it keeps things flowing very, very fast because there's just a little bit less math to go about. I think it's quite good. So yeah, the proficiency bonus is what you add into a lot of things. Every character has got a proficiency bonus that scales up with level. It starts as plus two. Um, and then if you are proficient in a skill, then you can add your proficiency bonus to those skill checks. As you go up in level, those proficiency bonuses increase and different classes have uh, different modifiers to that. So for example, the rogue specifically has a uh, quite a bit of a higher proficiency bonus with a certain type of tasks, for example. And there you go, baseline ability checks. Some of these numbers are obviously balanced, are, are changed in, in terms of how they're balanced. Uh, things grow a lot more sort of flat in 5e than some of the previous editions, uh, which means that the difference in the skill check that you might encounter at level 2 versus one you might encounter at level 6 is not going to be that major. Um, and I think it keeps a lot more things a lot more relevant throughout. You know, you can keep seeing the same enemies maybe a little bit more regularly and get a bit more reuse out of things, for example. Here's an example of the different categories that the skills fall under. Strength doesn't get a whole lot of love from uh, a lot of skills, but strength is pretty valuable in and of itself because of its increased to melee combat, obviously. Uh, group checks are a little bit different. Passive checks, it's nice that they've explicitly spelled this out. Basically, it's like taking a 10. This will come up mostly for something like perception and potentially also stealth, depending on which way you want to go for it. Usually it's a, it's a passive um, perception that you've got kicking around, and that way fewer people have to roll for things. There are, there are fewer opposed rolls, and more one side in the check is getting a passive version of it, and the other person is making an active roll against it, and it seemed to work pretty nice with uh, uh, perception versus traps and stealth creatures, for example. Um, and, uh, the rest of the checks are pretty standard. There are a few differences here and there with, you know, some of the specific things. Hiding, for example, is obviously uh, gets hugely tweaked with every edition of every game forever. It is worth noting that there's only a single stealth skill. There's not move silently and hide in shadows, for example, which honestly a lot of groups... Um, uh, house ruled to combine them together anyway, just to make life a tiny little bit simpler. And I think that's totally okay. All right. So um, we are going to, no, there's not combat yet. They're talking about what dexterity adds to, um, attack rolls, armor class initiative. Uh, it is worth noting at this point, I think I made a mistake in one of my previous videos. When you are using a weapon that allows you to use dexterity for the attack roll, you also get to add your dexterity modifier to the damage. Unless of course it's an offhand weapon, in which case other rules for that constitution still does hit points and different things and whatnot. And then there's saving throws. One of the big changes I think we mentioned in the last one is that there is a saving throw tied to every ability score, as opposed to just, you know, fortitude, reflexes, and willpower, for example. Now there's a strength saving throw. There's a dexterity saving throw, so on and so forth. Some will probably come up more often than others, but overall, I think it's a lot more clear and direct. It gives you more possibilities. The thing is, like, you get, like, more options and more ability to customize something, like, you know, if something should specifically be a strength saving throw, then you can do that as opposed to just having to use fortitude. So you get more options, but at the same time, it's 
more straightforward because you don't have to map like, well, okay, what does the fortitude bonus come from? Right, constitution. Oh, right, right, right. You know, you just call it what it is, and that that works perfectly fine. All right, the adventuring category. This this pair uh, this uh, chapter is always to me a little bit more of a dull one. You know, just some f bookkeeping kind of nonsense about travel pace and things, which I don't usually care about. Uh, jumping is a little bit different. Uh, you cover a number of feet up to your strength score if you move at least 10 feet on foot immediately before the jump. So that is like looks like no no check required for that so if you move at least 10 feet you can jump your strength score in feet which is a pretty far jump um but it's not you know it's not not unheard of it's not not unreasonable i would say uh, either way when you're clearing the jump cost foot of movement right so directly you know jumping movement is equal to uh, walking movement if uh, whatever and then there's high jump and different things like that. So simplified jumping rules, and I think that's okay. Strong people can jump further, sure. Uh, there's always the argument when it comes to stuff like jumping or climbing that should dexterity be more, or, or could you sub out dexterity instead of strength? A lot of people tend to house rule those sorts of things, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, the idea of a not very strong but lightweight and very dexterous person. I mean, dexterity is supposed to be like hand, like dexterity, you know, uh, your ability to manipulate things with your hands. So it doesn't necessarily make sense that you can jump or climb better, but also like a, your classic rogue is not a very strong person, but you imagine them being able to climb up walls and things relatively easily. On the other hand, I suppose the counter might be that you have more skills so you can be proficient in it. Ah, uh, suffocation, light, of course, one of the differences is that there's no more low light vision, there's simply dark vision, and I think that's probably fine, I, I don't see that as causing any sort of uh, issue whatsoever, it avoids a slight point of confusion, you know, does, does thing A have low light or dark vision, and what's the difference and how does it impact play? Uh, I think it's probably okay to combine all those things, food and water role playing, so on and so forth. Let's get to uh, let's get to combat. Oh, actually, one thing to mention over here in the resting, we have long rest and short rest mechanic, which anyone who played fourth edition will be familiar with. However, things are a little bit different here. A short rest is an hour. It is not five minutes. It's a whole hour, um, but it allows you to heal. A character can spend one or more hit dice at the end of a short rest up to the character's maximum number of hit dice which is equal to the character's level. So here's one of the things. The concept of hit dice have, has existed since the original, very earliest days of Dungeons & Dragons, at least the earliest days that I can remember. And um, they, for the longest time, basically translated to nothing except, well, you use this to... These are the number of dice that you roll to calculate your maximum hit points. Um, there are a few spell effects here and there that use hit dice, but that was pretty much it. Well, now, hit dice represent additional healing that you can use uh, to keep going. So uh, you can sort of kind of um, heal yourself up to your maximum on a rest like once because you do extend or expend your dice up until you do a full long rest and I think that is probably fine certainly uh, one of the things that D&D has always always had to tr struggle with is uh, how do you release or reduce certain times of um, tedium and also like downtime um the idea that many times in, uh, except for fourth edition, outside of fourth edition, there were a lot of problems where you, people would do one fight, expend all their resources, and then want to sleep, and then, you know, not get into any other encounters whatsoever. And so this concept of the short rest lets you kind of keep going. That combined with the fact that um, cantrips can be ca cast at will and never expire, and also the fact that a wizard will be able to also uh, restore one of their spells during a short rest, unless I'm mistaken, uh, will kind of remove this whole sort of like weird behavior that PCs like where they fight once and then they want to stop. This way, you know, you can stop for a short rest, heal yourself up, and then you can keep going and not really interrupt the adventure with sort of silly artificial min-max behavior. And then finally, yes, you've got the long rest. Now the long rest explicitly regains all lost hit points. Um, and, you know, some people like the, the gritty realism that, you know, it takes months and months to heal wounds, um, but that's never been what most role-playing games, in particular D&D, has been about. Uh, especially once you do have magic people thrown into the mix, usually people could full heal every night, kind of regardless. So um, I don't think this is a problem. And, of course, you can always house rule uh, the whole healing to work quite a bit differently. For example, it might be entirely conceivable for you to um, change it so that the long rest uses this hit dice based healing mechanic and maybe you only get one hit dice back every day or something so you could definitely sort of burn through that the, the thing to remember about hit points and wounds is hit points don't map to specific injuries in fact um, I think when fourth edition introduced the uh, the bloodied uh, mechanic it really made things quite explicit in that 
you weren't really taking true damage for a lot of your hit points. Um, we usually describe it uh, in our house rules as like, it's, you know, it's it's sort of a blow that, that could have killed you, right? Like, you know, it's not like people are just nicking away at your arms until finally for your final hit point, they decide to go for your heart. It's more like they're always trying to go for that fatal blow and, and using up some of your quote unquote hit points um, to not die represents some like extreme overexertion or force of will to just like at the last minute, just dodge out of the way or knock the thing away or, or have your armor absorb some of the hits while bruising you underneath kind of thing. Um, you know, those, those heroic sort of fights, you weren't, you know, you're not getting nicked and cut with every single one, not until you get below half health, you know, you enter that bloodied status, which we use when in our, in our home campaign, we play 3.5 ed, but we use that term bloodied. There are no rules behind it. You know, we have no mechanics based around the idea of bloodied, except for the occasional monster that decides to rage at bloodied, but it's a way of describing things. Once our DM tells us that something has become bloodied, we know that's below half health and we know we're hurting it for real. So there's different ways you can reintroduce that back in, but I think as a default, this is perfectly fine and very approachable. Uh, lifestyle expenses is an interesting way of working things too for uh, just dealing with, hey, here, pay this much money as kind of a maintenance for your lifestyle and that'll keep you, you know, housed and fed. I think that's fine. A few crafting rules thrown in here, um, which is nice. You've got like various professions and crafting that you can use to make a little bit of money during your downtime, which obviously is not going to be a big deal at higher levels, but early on might actually come up to help make you a few funds. You're not going to make a whole lot of money either way, but it's nice that they sort of acknowledge it. Listen, you can make things if you want. The rules are not complicated. Keep, just figure out how much it costs and we'll basically assume that's how long it takes to make it since it kind of makes sense. I mean, the idea is more expensive things I take some combination of more materials and more time to produce. So there you go. Uh, research for spells, training for additional skills. It's kind of nice that they've got some of those mechanics back in here because um, this used to be there in the old school games. You know, the idea that learning skills and languages wasn't just something you only got from leveling up and then, oh, you magically learned something new. Here's the idea that you can train yourself to learn something, but it takes time and money. All right. The important one, combat. Well, the important one in terms of rules changes. So there are a few here and there. Um, you know, the tweaks surprise a little bit. Um, but initiative is relatively, it's pretty much the same as it used to be. Your dexterity modifier gets added in there. On your turn, okay. On your turn, you basically get, in the old terminology, you get a move action and a standard action and a bonus action. I actually don't like the name bonus action. Um, I, I, I like the idea of the swift action. You know, the, the move standard and swift, I thought was quite clear. Like, okay, you can do this other thing that's like very minor and very fast. And I guess the bonus action is sort of there. But to me, a bonus action is like literally a whole extra action, a whole other bonus action. It doesn't resonate in my brain as like a class of actions that just comes up, you know, like a opportunity attack, for example. Um, but there we go. So move and then a standard action and then a bonus action. And maybe that's better, you know, certainly there was a lot of confusion in the past about the, the move standard and swift. Um, maybe just saying you can do a move and then you can do an action and then you can do a bonus. Maybe that works. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Uh, obviously, it's going to be different with between veterans and new players. And it, it's hard to put your, your mindset in one way versus another. Uh, but yeah, you get one bonus action. Uh, unless I'm wrong. One bonus action per turn, and sometimes you can take a bonus action during someone else's turn, like an opportunity attack, for example. Uh, which, or no, that's a reaction, my bad. That, that's a reaction is an opportunity attack, uh, which again, you normally just get the one. When you take a reaction, you can't take another one until you start your next turn. So you only get one opportunity attack, for example, which I think when I did my uh, online D&D campaign earlier for just using the basic rules, we'd miss that. There may have been some uh, multiple uses of the fighter's defensive abilities, for example. Uh, movement and position. I do like the fact that there's uh, also an explicit thing that um, when you move or you take an action, you can usually do something else like draw a weapon and things like that. Those are free things you can do while you do something else, which is very handy. Interesting change, a big rules change over here. You can break up your move. You can move, for example, if you've got a movement to 30 feet, you can move 10 take your action, and then move 20 feet after that. Uh, this not, did not used to be something that you could do in uh, like 3.5 edition, unless I'm unless we've been doing something completely wrong all along. You had to choose whether you were doing your move, then your standard, or the other way around. So, uh, And you generally needed something like spring attack to be able to do the move, attack, move kind of thing. So um, I think logically this will resonate with a lot of people. Uh, you know, I can just move 30 feet. Why can't I just move some of it, do an action, then move the rest of it? Why not? And I actually think it'll add a little bit more uh, tactics and flow to combat. Um, 
obviously you still need to um uh you still need to worry about opportunity attacks if you're moving away from someone but other than that there you go difficult terrain being prone moving around other creatures uh i don't know if it says it in here or not but uh one of the things they made got a rid of there's no more five foot step or um what do they call it in fourth edition shift right so um so what does this mean there, there are two implications this one you can move, if you're in melee combat with someone else, if you're in sort of base to base, you're adjacent to one another, you can move around your targets without drawing opportunity attacks. Um, you only draw an opportunity attack if you actually step away from your target. So even if you're in what we would call previously a threatened square, you can move to another threatened square without drawing an opportunity attack. That way, two people in melee combat can sort of dance around each other. And like, okay, that's that's fine. You're still sort of facing and acknowledging your attacker. Why why can't you just move around? Um, and then on the other hand, if you if you want to leave the square that is adjacent to someone in melee combat, there's no uh, there, you can't just take a five foot step or a shift move to get out of that. What you have to do is use the disengage action that we'll talk about later and basically eats your entire turn. But if you're doing the disengage thing, it's basically, it's like, you can imagine it as being sort of, you're being totally defensive and dodgy and tumbly. And what it allow, actually allows you to do is move through as many threatened squares as you want, uh, without drawing opportunity attacks. So we'll, we'll look at that in a second. You can move through creatures two sizes larger than you. If you're a halfling, then it can be a little bit smaller relatively standard various creature sizes and space and whatnot um attack they do have the variant here playing on the grid so explicitly in fifth edition you are not playing on a map uh it is acknowledging the old school sort of theater of the mind kind of thing um and certainly with my group playing 3.5 we alternate all the time whether we use the grid or not and depends entirely on what the fight is if it's a relatively open area and there's just maybe one person involved then there's almost never a reason to use a grid but if uh if we're fighting in a in a room or something that's got a lot of obstacles or a complicated terrain um and there's multiple attackers on both sides and maybe we broke out break out the grid and we keep everyone on five foot squares and sometimes we do sort of a hybrid where we have our sort of drawing of the area and we sort of just like put little marks to say yeah i'm standing around here okay now i'm going to move to like roughly over here is that about 30 feet yeah it's about 30 feet great so you know everyone can sort of like see at a glance uh what's going on um but we don't have to be rigid and use a grid and it mostly comes down to the complexity of the fight whether we can you know represent it entirely in our heads or not so it's nice that they've got the rules laid out for it but you don't have to use it um casting a spell the dash action gain extra movement with so you double your speed this is basically the old run i suppose um any increase or decrease your speed changes that yeah this this is your entire turn it used to be called run or maybe not run but like double move or whatever but yeah you're using your standard action to get almost a second move in a sense here you go here's the disengage action your movement does not provoke opportunity attacks for the rest of the turn so you can run through as many things as you want um while you're doing the disengage thing but you don't get to attack and I think that's a perfectly fine and elegant way to handle it. Obviously, you can't run th through an actual physical person unless they're two sizes larger than you are, but you can move through the squares that are adjacent to them just by being, you know, super defensive. Um, and you can take the dodge action. Again, it eats your whole turn, but any attack roll made against you has a disadvantage as long as you can see the attacker. Um, and you also get to make your dexterity saving throws with advantage, which is really cool. Uh, it's not a reaction or anything like that. So you really do, you, you know, you are giving up your whole attack, but in response, it will be much harder to be hit because disadvantage is very powerful. You can always help people next to you. And what you do is you give them advantage. So this replaces the old assist other thing where you had to make like a DC 10 check and you give a plus two thing and whatever. It's just like, listen, if you're combining two people together to do something, let's just give them advantage. You get double rolls. Boom, done. Yeah, okay, that's good. Because, I mean, the two people, each one of them could sort of have gotten one roll each already. So it doesn't make this much stronger. Yeah, the idea is that the one person doing it will therefore have, um, might be the one with the proficiency bonus, for example. Or there might be some other situation that means that you can really only do the check once. So that seems perfectly balanced to me. Hide, again, some of those things are there. The ready action, pretty much in chains. Search. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit changed, but not that much. Make an attack basically unchanged. Uh, the big difference is, of course, still the attack rolls and ACs will be a little bit flatter than they used to be. They don't go quite as uh, exponential. Um, you do add your proficiency bonus uh, if it applies to, you know, if it's a weapon that you know, for example. And uh, a 20 is always a hit 
and always a critical hit. A critical hit, well, I guess they'll talk about it later, but a critical hit, so there's no roll for confirmation or anything like that. And the way it works is you simply roll your dice twice. You don't add your modifier twice. So if you do damage, if your damage is something like 1d8 plus 2, then on a critical hit, you will roll 2d8 plus 2. If you want to, you could go back to, um, the, you could do the fourth edition thing where you simply max out your die roll. So on a 1d8, you would automatically do the 8 plus 2 or whatever your modifier is. Uh, and statistically, that will work out to just about the same. Most people like to roll dice because it's more exciting. So I think just, you know, doing 2d8 would make it much more exciting. And on a 1, of course, you always miss no matter what. Unseen targets, a little bit of, you know, extra mechanics there, but not much. Range attacks, you can make strength-based attacks like that are ranged depending on the weapon. We can look into those once we get the equipment. Melee attack, they do talk about range, ranged and unarmed. Again, not terribly different. Um, unarmed, uh, I don't believe you actually draw opportunity attacks though. In uh, 3.5 ed, for example, you would draw an opportunity attack if you're attacking unarmed versus someone who is armed, uh, unless you were like a monk or something like that. Uh, opportunity attacks, talk about there. It does use um, your the reaction, so a person can only make one opportunity attack per round. Two weapon fighting, so this is something that's a bit different. You can um, attack with a light melee weapon you're holding in one hand. You can use a bonus action to attack with a different light melee. So it does use your bonus action, and they both have to be light by default unless you have you know various optional stuff. Um, but you do get to make a second attack roll that round. There's no penalty to your attack rolls. You don't have to worry about being ambidextrous or anything like that. The only downside is you don't get to add your ability modifier to the damage of the offhand attack, unless it's negative. I mean, if you have a strength of six, for example, then yeah, you'll have to add that minus two damage um, to your offhand. But if it's positive, you don't get to add it. Um, there is a, uh, a fighter class variant that allows you to add your full modifier to the offhand, which is pretty good. Hey, it's grappling. Grappling is one of those rules that gets changed all the time. Uh, let's see how it works. You got to use a free hand, you do strength aesthetics, um, contested by their target strength or dexterity. Target always gets to pick their best one. Um, and yeah, if you succeed, the subject is tar is you subject the target to the grappled condition. Um, and then they'll be, that'll be described below. We should actually jump to that right away. So that was page 74. If we go right to the end, they do list some conditions back here. So how does grapple work? Creature speed becomes zero. Conditions ends if the grappler is incapacitated. Condition also ends if an effect removes the grapple creature from the reach. Okay. It can't benefit any bonus of speed. So if you're grappled, you can still do everything. Um, there's no pin status or anything like that. You can still fully attack. You can fully cast spells. You just can't move away, which is really the fourth edition style of grapple. And it is unfortunate that um, it, grappling doesn't kind of do more or give you all like the crazy wrestling options that used to exist in the old rules. But the problem is grappling is so incredibly complicated to resolve in, in a sort of more realistic style um, that... I even when we play our third edition, we adopted the fourth edition rules of like, listen, we're going to make grappling super useful, super simple. It uses up one of your arms to initiate and maintain the grapple and you can't move. Other than that, everything is like fine. You guys can hack away each other, cast spells, do whatever it needs to happen. Uh, and that's okay. Obviously ranged attacks. If you're in melee, uh, well, then uh, you usually get disadvantage on your attack roll. And they probably have said that. Um, range attacks in close combat. You get disadvantage in attack. So you don't provoke an attack of opportunity if you use your uh, range attacks in close combat, but you personally get disadvantage, which is also horribly, horribly bad. Uh, cover explanation. This is uh, the one thing I found where there's like specific numbers to sort of remember here. Half cover is plus two bonus to AC index. Three quarters cover is plus five and total cover you can't be directly targeted. Um, I'm actually surprised that they didn't decide that like this was advantage or, or something like that, especially on one of them. Uh, but there you go. Plus two for half, plus five for three quarters cover. Hit points describes that. Damage roll is pretty standard. Critical hits we just described there are a few damage types that they go and specify um, they're not particularly important here other than yeah some people will have damage resistances and vulnerability if you're resistance you take half damage if you're vulnerable you take double damage boom done simple i like it healing dropping to zero okay so things are a little bit different uh as we learned doing our D, &D live stream uh, you can do an instant death if you do so there first of all there's no negative hit points in fifth edition Zero as low as you can get. But if an attack brings you to zero and there's enough damage left over that that damage is equal to or exceeds your hit point maximums, you die. 
And actually, these numbers here are pretty much exactly what we saw in our demo. So Cleric with a maximum of 12 hit points is currently at 6, gets hit for 18. That brings her down to 0, but 12 damage is left over, which is equal to her larger than her max hit points, meaning that's instant death. That's going to be pretty uncommon, especially after the first couple of levels. There's usually going to be enough of margin between 0 and max to make that pretty unlikely. So normally what happens is you go to zero, you become unconscious. Uh, monsters that go to zero by default die, but you can choose to knock a creature out instead if you want. And then, yeah, on your turn, once you're at zero, you got to start doing a saving throw, which uh, there's usually no modifiers for. You just roll a d20. If you get to 10 or higher, you succeed. If you fail three times, then you die. If you succeed three times, you get stable which means nothing bad happens anymore. You don't have to make any death saving throws at all. If you're stable, you'll automatically return to one hit point after 1d4 hours and become conscious again. So if you roll three successful death saving throws, you're no longer bleeding to death, but you're not awake yet. If you fail three times, you die. If you roll a one, it counts as two failures. And if you roll a 20, you instantly regain one hit point. You go to one hit point and you're once again conscious. If you take damage, at zero hit points. It doesn't actually matter what the um, what the damage was. Um, well, that's not entirely true. If you take damage, you suffer a death saving throw. If it's a crit, you get double death, er, double failures. And yeah, then based on that damage, the damage exceeds your, your hit point maximum. You'll do the instant death thing again. Um, temporary hit points, pretty much unchanged. Mounted combat. Who, who does mounted combat or underwater combat? Honestly. All right. Spell casting. So we talked about spell casting mostly during when we talked about the classes that could do spell casting. Hey, did you guys know the uh, fifth edition bard will be a full spell caster? Yeah. Like straight up same progression as like a wizard. Uh, maybe end up with like fewer spells known slash memorizations or just have a different spell pool or whatever. But a bard will get ninth level spells at level 17, I think. Pretty exciting. Okay. So spells, same as before, they go from 0 to 9. Zeroth level spells are cantrips. Uh, they can be cast at will and are never expended. Um, although, you know, you might only, you know, have X number of cantrips that you can cast on that day. Not X number, you have, you you can, that you might have X specific cantrips that you can cast on any given day, given things. Sorry about that background noise. I was rendering video in the background. No, just finished. Um, and yeah, so... There's known and prepared spells, depending on what kind of class you have. Uh, your divine cat, your cleric, for example, knows all their spells, but has to prepare a limited subset of those. A mage only knows the spells in his or her spell book, and again, still has to prepare those spells after that. Um, some people will have a spontaneous casting of any spell they know. Uh, certainly possible. Um, you then get spell slots. And what's interesting about spell slots is... This is where the big change happens from the previous edition. Again, we talked about this a lot earlier. Um, but yeah, you have a specific number of spell slots. So this example here, the third level wizard, might have four first level spell slots and two second level spell slots. And when you cast a spell of the appropriate level, it burns one of those spell slots. And it, again, it doesn't eliminate one of your memorizations. If you have memorized, I don't know, magic missiles, a first level spell, and you cast it, it uses up one of your first level spell slots, but it doesn't actually expend your spell from memory. You never have to memorize magic missile more than once. You memorize it once, and then this wizard, for example, could cast it anywhere between zero and four times that day. But obviously when you run out of first level spell slots, you can't cast any more of those spells. Well, that's not entirely true because you can use a higher level spell slot to cast a spell. I could cast Magic Missile using a second level spell slot. That is perfectly fine. And in fact, a lot of spells will scale up. If you use a higher level spell slot to cast it, they will do more damage or have some other effect like that. So um, it's a great mechanic. I think it's it's lovely. It's a little bit reminiscent of like psionics with PowerPoints and things, but infinitely more uh, sort of simple, I, I think, or straightforward. I, I like it a lot. I think it's a fantastic system. And yeah, you can cast a spell at higher level. Cantrips you never use up. Uh, if, if some of the cantrips scale up with your caster level. Um, so there are some sort of basic attack cantrips and they will become more powerful over time just so that they stay, stay, stay relevant. They're going to be your standard sort of bread and, bread and butter spells that you can cast over and over and over in combat and you never have to resort to hitting someone with a stick like some sort of savage. Rituals are very cool. Some spells can be cast as a ritual. A ritual takes 10 minutes to cast, generally speaking, but what's excellent is it doesn't expend a spell slot. 
So you could cast rituals all day long and never run out. The downside is it takes a long time to do it. Um, with the rituals, uh, so it doesn't use a spell slot. If you're a cleric, for example, you do have to have prepared that spell for the day, in which case you have the option of casting it instantly out of using a spell slot or as a ritual without using a spell slot but with requiring 10 minutes longer as a wizard you don't you can cast any spell as a ritual that you have in your spell book the reason it doesn't work that way for a priest is because priests automatically know all the spells right they they don't have a spell book they just know all of them they just have a limited set of preparations so with a wizard you do you don't have access to all wizard spells ever you only have the access to the ones that are in your um your your spell book but you don't have to have prepared the ones that you can cast as a ritual if you're okay with casting them slower. That'll be things like read magic, comprehend languages, uh, detect magic. I don't know. There's a bunch of different stuff that you can cast as a ritual. And that was one of my favorite things about the fourth edition introduction. They introduced these rituals. Um, but I, overall, I don't like their magic system. The, the fact that all their quote-unquote spells were all like direct combat spells that were kind of samey. Um, and then they had their rituals, which is kind of the interesting stuff. I like this system where... There are just spells, and some of them can be cast as a ritual, which is really cool. All right, casting time. This is pretty much unchanged from earlier versions. You know, verbal, somatic, material components, awesome. Uh, some spells can be cast as bonus actions or reactions. This is very cool. Uh, you know, range. Um, I think one of the things to note is that the areas are mostly square in here because I think uh, they use fourth edition one-to-one um, -one, like diagonal movement and everything. Um, concentration, this is a good one to talk about. So there's a bunch of spells. Some spells are instantaneous. Some will have fixed duration. A lot of them will have duration with concentration, or sometimes the duration will just be concentration. You, usually it's not just concentration. Usually the, the duration would be something like one minute per level, parentheses, concentration. And what does that mean? You can only maintain one concentration spell at any given time. If you cast another spell that has a duration that requires concentration, then it will cancel your first spell. There's no other penalty to concentration. You can still cast other spells um, while you are concentrating on one. Okay, you can you can move, you can attack, you can cast spells while you're concentrating on something. It's fine. This just makes it so that the game they can balance how many buffs you can have running at any given time by making some of the more potent buffs or debuff type spells or area spells require concentration. I think it's actually probably going to be a great system. We'll see how it plays out in practice. But I, I, I as soon as I read about this, I'm like, yeah, this is going to be good. So yeah, if you cast another spell that requires concentration, it cancels out. And if you take damage, you do have to make a constitution saving throw to make sure you don't lose concentration. I think that's totally fine. And yeah, if you get, you're get you becoming incapacitated or killed, then obviously you lose concentration there, and it goes away. And you can decide other things that might require some extra stuff. But there we go. I think that's great. Schools of Magic are still in. Wonderful. Love it. Um, here we go. The area effects are defined. The cone cones are really nice and simple. The width is equal to the length cool uh cubes they also do have cylinders and lines and spheres and things like that um right because of course yeah i was talking about like diagonal movement is one-to-one -one, and i think that is true but the game is not played on a grid by default so again we can have like sort of true spheres and cylinders again which is nice uh sometimes you need attack rolls and saving throws which are based on your um your spell casting ability modifier so for wizards that'll be intelligence clerics that'll be wisdom bards i assume will be charisma for example you do get to add your proficiency bonus there and anything else so saving throws are like passive they're static so your saving throw for a certain spell might just be 14 period and then someone has to make a save against that and then when it's an attack roll it's more of an active three you roll a d20 plus your spell casting ability modifier plus your proficiency bonus uh, i think that's that's swell and great the fact that this is an eight is a little bit harder to remember um but i can see why from a balance point of view the eight works out but it's a little bit uh yeah it's like it's not a 10 it's an eight all right a little bit of backstory there and then we talk about the actual spells uh the basic rules i suspect will not have the full set of spells there'll probably be some others added in to the actual player's handbook and of course any additional books that come out after the fact that may or may not be true maybe player's handbook will only have these but i suspect there'll be a few more uh, especially since they do have some other classes. We know at least the Bard will be in there. I believe the Druid will be, but at this time, I don't think the Druid info has been um, teased out yet, but the Bard has been. So yeah, handful of spells, and then the spell descriptions. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through these, but other than what I've mentioned before, again, you can cast, say, Aid over here. Uh, aid I quite like, actually. 
uh, the way that they've worked it this time. Duration is eight hours. Um, choose up to three creatures within range. Each creature's ma hit point maximum and current hit points are increased by five for the duration. Very straightforward. Three allies um, that you can include yourself, I believe. Uh, yeah, choose up to three creatures within range. It's fine. Um, so you each get five extra hit points. Uh, level three, which is when you can start casting second level spells. That is a decent number. But then, yeah, you can cast it as a higher level thing and you get more hit points. It's never going to turn into huge amounts, but it's not a concentration spell. And a few extra hit points are never going to be bad. All right. Um, what's another spell I might want to uh, look at? Um, no, not Augury. Oh, Blur. Blur is very straightforward. It's, uh, it lasts for one minute. Uh, casting time is one action. So it does use up a whole action. It lasts for a whole minute. So basically the length of a combat. It is a concentration spell. But for the duration, any creature has disadvantage attack rolls. Disadvantage is really, really good. It, it will make it less likely for people to hit you. I'm not convinced Blur is going to be a very strong spell. Um, I don't like anything that uses up a whole action. Uh, so you lose your first round in combat all the time. I suppose if you have surprise, it might work, but it uses up concentration. If this were, you know, 10, 15 minutes, something like that, or one minute per level, then all of a sudden it becomes quite nice because it can actually last potentially more than one encounter in sort of a dungeon setting. Uh, as is, I feel like Blur is going to be a little bit too weak. Uh, Burning Hands is the first level spell, and again, does scale up. Uh, so I'm going to find a cantrip that might be a good one to show off here. Um, evocation, evocation. Oh, dance, oh, that's a cantrip, though. That, uh, that's not a very exciting cantrip. I was hoping to find one that maybe did damage. Uh, here you can see Detect Magic is something that can be cast as a ritual. So it lasts 10 minutes, concentration-based. I think that's totally fine. And yeah, you can cast it as a ritual, and then you don't use up a spell, as long as it's in your spellbook. So I suspect that wizards may not prepare Detect Magic that often. Might be nice to do it occasionally, like to uh, to be able to quickly detect something. But um, and, and the fact that you don't expend spells mean you don't have to memorize like five copies of Magic Missile or anything like that. So um, it becomes very viable maybe to just keep your Detect Magics around. Who knows? Uh, what am I looking for? Let's find one interesting spell to discuss to close out. Um, again, I'm hoping for a cantrip. There we go. Firebolt might be a good example. So this is a cantrip. It uh, takes your standard action, range of 120 feet, instantaneous. Hurl a moat of fire at a creature or object within range. Make a ranged spell attack against target. On hit, the target takes 1d10 fire damage. A flammable object hit by the spell ignites if it isn't being worn or carried. And it levels up. When you get to level 5, it becomes 2d10. 11th level 3d10 and then 17th level 4d10 you can again you can cast this at will so basically it's it's very similar to being able to hit people with a longbow or something like that okay you don't get to add any bonus uh damage from your stats so someone firing a longbow would do i i believe it's still 1d8 in fifth edition but they would get to add their dexterity modifier so 1d8 plus you know plus two or plus three or maybe even plus four so firebolt does slightly less damage than a longbow and then at fifth level yeah it starts to do more damage but of course so will everyone else because they'll be getting you know magic longbows that do bonus damage maybe they'll be able to attack twice around do all kinds of things like that for example um, so the idea is that these cantrips will be similar to a kind of vanilla, uh, very basic um, melee or ranged attack, but you know, magic and awesome and fine. And I'm a big fan of that. That's one of my favorite things from fourth edition is the fact that wizards always had stuff they could just kind of do at will. And also the reduced bookkeeping, uh, which fifth edition continues, but while having the depth and interesting options that... Um, editions before fourth edition have i really felt like uh, a lot of um of that was lost in fourth ed yeah you know it was a great balance kind of game it was good miniatures combat game but it wasn't dungeon dragons um and that's really what it came down to it's not, fifth or fourth edition wasn't bad it just wasn't really D D. so anyway that brings us to the end of this uh look at the changes in fifth edition i'm very much looking forward to the player's handbook actually being released uh because i'm looking forward to uh looking at the uh the other classes that were not in the basic rules and also the extra variants because every class in here only had one variant presented in the book and it'll be quite interesting to see what the other possible options are see you next time folks Bye bye